My name is Jeff Barrett, and it's always good to be back in Missouri, my home state. I was uh, born and raised and graduated from Neosho High School. Anybody know where Neosho, Missouri is? All right. A lot of people drive past it really fast, so I'm glad you know where it's at. But it's always, and I'm so glad to see the sunshine because it was 70 degrees in Denver when I left yesterday. I've been in Denver for about 15 years, and it's so good to be back in um, Kansas City, which I'm seeing is booming and growing. The workforce is really thriving here. That's exciting to see. And I want to continue the thanks to the Kauffman Foundation, our new friends to Emily Griffith Technical College, for having this convening, for inviting me to come and speak about something that's near and dear to my heart, and that's workforce. And Miles, it's interesting in noting that the last poll question, the most important skill for the workforce today was computer science. Computer science, that's a big, broad term. Google will say, I'd rather hire a philosopher and teach him how to code. LinkedIn says, and LinkedIn is a great partner of ours, along with Skillful.com, which they launched in Denver, Colorado, and had the uh, launching at my site. Got to meet Alan Blue, the co-founder of LinkedIn. They're doing some great things and helping us in data analytics. They say communications is the most important skill. We can teach you that aptitude, but if you have the attitude and have these basic skills, we can teach that. How many business leaders are in the audience today? You guys want those communication skills, don't you? Yes. Absolutely. Imagine a world where there's a post-secondary institution that has no barriers. Transportation, not a barrier. Daycare, not a barrier. High tuition, not a barrier. Scheduling. Do you remember trying to figure out how to get that science lab with the English class and the whole smorgasbord of things? We do something a little bit different. The things that keep students from having success at my institution are not the things that happen in the classroom. It are the things that happen outside the classroom. In 1916, a visionary by the name of Emily Griffith, and I encourage you to write that name down and Google her, for a couple of reasons. Started a public institution that was the first free vocational institution in America. 102 years ago, she was living in a time where women weren't even allowed to vote. And yet she was a pioneer doing some things in workforce development that we only think about. You've heard the term competency-based education, right? She did that 102 years ago. It was a buzzword now, it's a buzzword now. She was doing that then. Our mission at Emily Griffith Technical College is simple. We prepare students for today's workforce and tomorrow's opportunities. Emily Griffith herself had a mantra that said, we provide opportunities for all who wish to learn. In higher education, sometimes we forget who our customers are. Some people say our main clients and customers are our industry partners. Yes, they're a big customer client. Or our faculty and staff. Yes, but guess who our biggest customers are in higher education? Students. My mantra at every back to college day is very simple. We have to meet students where they're at. And they're in a whole bunch of different places in their life, aren't they? The next three um, points there, culture, innovation, and continuous improvement, Im improvement, are the three values, our three core values that we have at my organization. These values Bear in mind all of our stakeholders. But at the end of the day, we have to meet students where they're at. So our culture, we have to be transparent about what we charge our students. And we don't charge them very much. Emily Griffith envisioned educating students debt-free. And my foundation president, Albie Siegel, who's in the audience somewhere, if he raises his hand, helps raise millions of dollars to help every one of my students graduate debt-free. How many of you had a student loan when you graduated? Yeah. My students don't. My tuition in the last five years has been less than the CPI, Consumer Price Index, in Denver. Less. I could raise it more, but we choose not to. Innovation is a huge thing. We let industry drive our curriculum. We bring them in the classroom. We hire faculty that have industry experience. 
The problem we're having right now is training these faculty in pedagogical, classroom management. The teaching's hard, isn't it? <laughs> right? My career started in manufacturing. I worked 16 years in manufacturing. I worked for Sunbeam down in southwest Missouri. We had a large manufacturing plant. Then I worked for an OEM out of Franklin Park, Illinois. We sold nuts, bolts, and screws. Nothing real sexy there, but they put things together. And we listen to our industry. We have advisory councils, yes. I have an executive advisory council of CEOs, HR directors, that come in and tell me how to vision for the next 100 years. Continuous improvement, this is for students as well. We have to constantly be nimble. We have to be responsive to our industry needs and what our students are telling us what they need. So in the last couple years, we developed, instead of taking a bunch of different courses, a cohort model where you take a block of classes in the morning, a block of classes in the afternoon, or a block of classes at night, or sometimes you go all day. And because of it, we have some pretty impressive success stories. <clears throat> we serve about 8,000 students, it's grown, primarily underserved first gen. We're a Hispanic serving institution. We also serve concurrent enrollment students from 31 sending high schools, not just Denver Public Schools. By the way, Denver Public Schools is the fastest growing urban school district in the country. 92,000 students now. Can you imagine that? We are part of Denver Public Schools as their post-secondary arm. I don't receive funding from them. I receive from higher ed, tuition and fees, et cetera. We have three campuses and we have a statewide apprenticeship program, 19 different sites. We're now serving over 4,000 apprenticeship students. Our outcomes are very high. Higher ed doesn't like to talk about accountability a lot, and I apologize to you higher ed people in the room, not really, but we need to be more accountable for what we do. Our completion, placement, and licensure over the past few years has been astounding. We've completed our students at an 84% rate. We've, we've placed our students at an 85% rate. And for those licensure exams, think LPN, think Barbie and Cosmetology, CNA, you name it, 99% first time pass rate. Right? Yeah, I wish I could take credit for that, but I have an exceptionally great team. We have a foundation that supports us. Higher ed sometimes isn't as entrepreneurial as it needs to be. I come from a private sector experience, 16 years of that. Our foundation has been amazing in supporting us. We have these great business and in industry leaders, very diverse in ethnicity, in background. And last year they raised $2.5 million for the college to give to us. Because Colorado, like Missouri, we don't fund our education very well. We have five state-recognized workforce programs. We're very innovative. We partnered with a company out of California, Striver Labs, and we are the first educational institution they're partnering with. They partner with Walmart, BMW, the United Rentals, to do virtual reality training. Have you ever done that? It's amazing. And what are our students? I see some students here in the, in the front row. You want to be engaged, right? Technology does that for you, doesn't it? We utilize technology pretty heavily in engaging our students. We developed um, two catalogs, one in construction. So they filmed a construction site. So when you're in this Oculus and you're doing this tutorial and then an assessment, you're actually standing on a construction site. It's a little unnerving at first. Things are going on around you and you engage and reinforce what you're learning in the classroom and lab. We use augmented reality. You can take your phone and you have a barcode on a, on a piece of equipment like an, an engine in a car and you can explode that into a 3D model where you can see how that part is taken apart. We use technology a lot. I want to talk about the Willy Wonka syndrome. Remember Gene Wilder? Rest in, rest in peace. The baccalaureate degree has been viewed as the golden ticket for a long time, forever. That's how you measure success, right? And it's still a great measure of success, but it's not the only pathway, right? It's not the only pathway. Does anybody know what the fastest growing credential in this country is? Certificates. 
whether it be an executive certificate, you can go to Wharton and pay millions of dollars for and get, or you can get a certificate from Emily Griffith Technical College. We gotta get past this philosophy that that's the only pathway and the only measure of success. I have multiple degrees. Aaron and I were talking about, you know, I have a BA in English. You know what that means? Graduate school. <laughs> I wanna talk about stackable credentials and permeability. Another thing that higher ed needs to work more on is permeability and the portfolio experience. Students come to us with all kinds of experiences. They have credits from internships in high school and concurrent enrollment and military experience and they may have been in a community college in a four year and back to the community college and we make it really hard to package all that together. We have to stop that. I love this quote. There's this university, the University of Southern New Hampshire, they market like crazy. You've seen the commercial, right? There's this graduation commencement speech. This is a quote the guy used, the president. The world we live in equally distributes talent, but it does not equally distribute opportunity. Isn't that the truth? There is so much talent. We just heard about it. But the opportunity needs to be there. We need to erase the equity gaps. I'm serving on um, a coalition back in Colorado, the Department of Higher Ed put together, on doing just that. We call it the Equity Champion Group. <clears throat> I was fortunate to attend a governor's delegation in Switzerland. No, it wasn't a boondoggle. They worked my ass off for a week. But I went there with a the governor and 50 business leaders, higher ed leaders, secondary leaders, to look at their apprenticeship program. And there are two things that stuck out about the Swiss trip. One, 70% of all students who graduate from compulsory education at 16, by the way, enter into an apprenticeship program. These students that I talked to are building trains, planes, and automobiles. They may not stay in that field, but they've created a permeable system to where they can move in and out of experiences. Maybe move on from a technical baccalaureate into a PhD and become an engineer or a STEM area. Very impressive. We're doing tons of work with Denver Public Schools in concurrent enrollment. They have a program called Career Connect, which is a youth apprenticeship program that we took back from Switzerland. And I work very closely on MOU agreements with our two and four year partners. I'm trying to get more and more credits transferred from certificates and apprenticeship opportunities into higher ed because those experiences are valuable. And those companies, a construction company, if there's a construction company in this room, if they can hire one of their technicians who became a journeyman and wants to become a foreman or superintendent and needs that business acumen, let's don't slow him or her down. Let's transfer 60 credits into a baccalaureate experience from that apprenticeship program. I'm working and doing just that, and we're going to launch that this fall. Fields where apprenticeships are growing. You think about construction, right? Obvious. Pipe fitters, iron workers, sheet metal. But now there's IT, healthcare. They're growing at astounding rates. We're doing that work as well, and I'll talk about an example here in a second. Competency-based education is shifting the higher ed landscape, folks. I hate the words. Maybe it's two words. Seat time. <laughs> it's slowing us down, folks. Let's accelerate them through. This was an interesting study done by um, the Pew Research Report in association with the Markle Foundation, another partner of ours who fund uh, skillful.com, which is an amazing site to go and check out. They did a report in 2016 titled The State of American Jobs. This is what they said. Couple things. Just 16% of all Americans think that a four year degree prepares students very well for a well paying job in today's economy. Wow. Two year colleges see similar stats. I've been a dean at three of them, three different states. 12% prepare students well versus 26% of those holding a professional or technical certification. Stackable credentials, they're not going away. And I'm doing some research right now, along with the Gallup organization to help out with that, to look at the economic benefit of a stackable credential versus a traditional educational pathway to see if there is a difference. So how do we reshape success? We're at a pivotal point in higher ed, in my opinion. We really are. The legislature in Colorado has recognized credentials, industry certifications, and have awarded a ton of money to help foster that growth for those demonstrated, marketable, middle skills jobs. These are three things, when I say meeting students where they're at, that students want and demand. 
they become pretty good consumers, haven't they? Time? How much time is it going to take me to get through this program? And can I accelerate it in some way? Money? How much is this going to cost? I don't want to contribute to that trillion-dollar student debt issue that exists in this country. And outcomes. What am I going to get at the end of the road? What kind of jobs are out there for me that I can realistically get without having to move somewhere? You can move to Denver. A lot of people are. <laughs> I talked about this earlier, this portfolio experience, competency-based education, project-based learning, credit for prior learning. How are we going to transcript all this stuff? It's tough. Concurrent enrollment. Stackable credentials allow students to earn while they learn with permeability. And I'll give you a couple examples here in a second. Two new models that we're implementing this year. One is the Colorado Visiting Nurse Association. That's what CVNA stands for. It's a partnership where they approached us and said, we've got a thousand of these across the state in home health care, in clinics and hospitals, mostly home health care, in which we have personal care workers that we want to start in high school making 12, 14 an hour, take them through your CNA program, go through your LPN program, find a partner to do the associate degree in nursing, and then get a BSN, so they go from $12, four years later they're at $40 as a BSN. Does that sound like an apprenticeship? It is. And then we are partnering with a group called Tectonic Group. It's a software developing company out of Boulder. And they approach us. They're not getting college credit for their experiences. They're the first software development um, apprenticeship, maybe in the country. I know they are in Colorado, but maybe in the country. They're up there by the Google campus. We're going to partner with them to give a college credit for their experiences and take the students in high school through our network administration program, get the A-plus certification and others, and then sponsor them through the apprenticeship program, which is $10,000 currently through a program-related investment of some type for you foundation people out there. That's a new term in higher ed, by the way, that's happening. And then six months later, they'll graduate and start a job, 60, 70 K. That's a pretty good ROI, isn't it? So I want to leave you with one quote that I read last night um, while doing some social media. College isn't the best fit for everyone. But in today's world, it doesn't have to be. There are a multitude of educational pathways that lead to fulfilling careers. They just don't get the same level of attention as a traditional college path. That was pretty powerful for me to read and just reaffirm what the work we're doing. But the reality is this. There's many ways to get there. How many of you started in a degree program and finished in that degree program and are working in a field related to that degree program? Yeah, not very many. <laughs> Same here. Manufacturing, now I'm running a large educational organization. But what I want to leave you with and must impress upon you once again, we all have to meet students where they're at and then help get the resources to be successful, listen to our industry partners, engage our students, graduate them on time in a well-paying job. Thank you for your attention this morning. Have a great day.